nice thing about doing history is you're never going to get it all done in one shot. So I'm going to miss stuff, and I'm not going to feel guilty about it. Uh, knowing that, uh, you know, we'll always be able to correct it and change it in the future. So, uh, as Lynn said, I moved here in 1978, which means all of those folks that grew up here and went down to Auto Row and bought their cars there or hung out there know a lot more about this than I do. Uh, my fat fascination is discovering old photographs and digging into them as far as I can to discover stuff in them. And that's what we're going to do tonight. So we're going to just really enjoy the story of Cox Avenue and E.W. Grove. It starts here. Okay, there's the Battery Park Hotel, the first one sitting way atop Battery Porter Hill. Over there is the Margo Terrace, and I want you to keep in mind what it looks like right there, how much uh, below the level of Battery Porter Hill it sat. That's the level of Patton Avenue back then. And this in the foreground is the North State Fitting School on Buxton Hill. And Mr. and Mrs. Mr. Rob, Mr. and Mrs. Roberts ran the North State Fitting School there and taught Tom Wolfe history and English in 1912 to 1914. So this is another photo that I discovered, and the problem about doing research like this is getting sidetracked, because I, I know a lot about the Battery Park uh, Hotel, but I was really wondering, what is that in the background? <laughs> and so, of course, it sent me off on a tangent, <laughs> and it's the North Asheville Emony Church mm -hmm. South, and it was built for an African-American congregation, architect Richard Sharp Smith, in 1903, uh, they sold it uh, in the 1930s to move to a larger location on Hill Street, Hillside Street, and it was replaced by this. Okay, now you know where that is because you all go shop at Trader Joe's, right? Or Harris Teeter, that's right. So let's get back to the uh, Battery Park. So again, sorry, there's... I can't hear you as well as you think I can. Okay, well... I'm sorry. All right, well, I'm just going to have to shout into this. Okay. So, um, this, again, is the Margot Terrace. And uh, I, again, I want to remind you, just keep in mind how obscured it is by the hill. That's the top of the hill. What's Margot and Terrace now? The Margot Terrace is uh, where the... Uh, the parking lot for the telephone building. Okay. Yes. You can still see the original stone border wall on um, South Ridge Broad and along Haywood Street. So that's the that's the height of the uh, the pile, and we all have been told, those of us that have been here long enough, that it uh, went all the way up to where the flagpoles stick out from the second battery parking. And that's the extent of the hill that had to be removed. That's from Wall Street all the way over to the very foot of the uh, second battery park. So what do you do with all that dirt? Well, that's the Battery Park Hotel. This is the 1891 uh, Bird's Eye Inn. That's Billmore Avenue. That's over near where um, the Orange Peel is today. Patton Avenue, that's where the federal building is. There's Haywood Street. Then there's South French Broad Avenue, Ashland Avenue, and Church Street. And there's the big gully that uh, Grove determined that he was going to put all that dirt in. Oh, all my surprises. <laughs> It started with building, uh, excavating for the foundation of the Bon Marche building, which E.W. Grove built and then leased to uh, Solomon Lipinski. Wow. Once the excavation of that was done, they moved the um, steam shovels over to uh, Otis Street on the other side of the, the Battery Park Hill and started to excavate on that side. This 
was the ongoing, uh, represents the ongoing conflict that was occurring at the time. Uh, some people thought that what Grove was doing was the best thing you could imagine. You know, he, he was in the spirit of Asheville in the 20s, uh, and at the same time you had long timers uh, like Dr. Battle, who, who just really lamented the loss of that hill, where they used to go up and watch the sunset. And I, I guess I'm more one of the sentimental simps. <laughs> but uh, doesn't this bear to some of today's conflicts? Okay. Do people need me to read that to them? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, the, the uh, progressive nut is saying, I'm for leveling Mount Mitchell and all the rest of the hills around here if they stand between me and progress. And that's meant my sentiments. If, and then the sentimental simp on the right is saying, if this progressive movement keeps up, we won't have any mountains left, and our beautiful scenery will all be replaced by horrid skyscrapers and ugly streets. Oh, progress, what crimes are committed in thy name? <laughs> so as excavation commenced, uh, they were going to make sure that anything they could sell, they would sell. So uh, soon after it began, they advertised dirt for sale. About a year later, you could buy sod. So there's the, about the last bit of the hill up close to the... Uh, to the Battery Park Hotel. Some of the dirt was moved right across Haywood Street to uh, build a concourse around the um, George Vanderbilt Hotel. The excavation actually started almost a year before the uh, Battery Park closed, but we figured they were down on Otis Street, chipping away at the southern end of the hill uh, so they still had guests all the way up to then. And how did they get that dirt moved around? Well, they advertised for mule teams. And there you could see some of them lined up, waiting to have the carts loaded up. And a, pretty much immediately, this became a controversy. Um, there were almost a million cubic yards of dirt that were moved, and the uh, one one observer said even if each one of those mule carts was only dropping a teacup full of dirt, it was adding up, and it was really uh, angering people uh, along um, Patton Avenue and Haywood Street, uh, and so all manner of ideas came about. Well, well, let's build a conveyor. Let's let's move it above Patton Avenue. Uh, and you know, the people who are coming up with these ideas are the the guys from the excavation company, and they're just trying to throw ideas out to placate the folks that are complaining about it. And then someone else said, "Well, let's build a tunnel underneath Patton Avenue, and let's move it that way." But during all this time. The, uh, the police and the courts were, were active. Uh, they were arresting violators uh, for dropping the dirt, and uh, it was going on uh, to the point where city, the city um, commissioners could no longer turn their eye away from it. And so they tried to come up with ideas. And the mayor at the time, John Cathy, uh, said, well, why don't, we, why don't we use a sluice and, and do it that way. Well, by doing a sluice, you're basically turning all that dirt to mud and you're just having it pour down into uh, Cox Street. And I don't think that ever happened. Uh, so, you know, by the end of two, uh, 1923, they had police looking after it. At the same time that the excavation was going on, uh, the they were trying to get every bit of sales out of the property. So you could buy lavatories, windows, sheeting, anything. You, you could uh, get the furniture. And then someone bought almost all the remaining furniture and tried to sell it. Um, once the inn was empty, it was uh, a perfect target for fires. 
and there were at least two small fires that were extinguished, but then there was a big fire, and it left it looking like that. Um, and what, what I find interesting is that our local paper was a real booster for Asheville at the time. You could say it was a partner with the Chamber of Commerce. Um, there is no record that I could find where showing this photo and showing this devastation at the end. Um, there were little stories about it, but uh, I was I figured that the, the uh, paper didn't want people to see such, that such a big fire had occurred. So they were digging away uh, almost two years, uh, and then they were real pleased because they were at the point where uh, someone standing in Haywood Street would finally be able to look up Battery Park Avenue and see someone standing on Otis Street. So they had finally gotten that much cleared away. And of course, boosterism was quite thick in the air. So you had these, uh, these folks, uh, uh, local business leaders, down in the gully or down at the hill, uh, holding up a poster saying, Asheville, a mountain moving city. <laughs> This is pretty close to the, when the, um, the upper part of the excavations were done. There's that, just that one hill left over to the left. And there you see the, the Margot Terrace, now standing prominently on the remainder of the hillside there. So if you compare that with your mind's eye view of it from earlier, before you can see how much of that dirt was removed. This is what Grove wanted. He wanted a nice, flat, open piece of property that he could develop, that he could sell to others, sell to stores, uh, and he advertised it for sale relentlessly. Among his modest statements, paved with smooth asphalt over concrete, with curb inclined to save tires, and concrete sidewalks 12 feet wide, providing parking space for 500 cars and pedestrian space for 14,000 people. Well, Grove was definitely the darling of Asheville at that time. Um, this is what was said uh, about him at uh, a banquet that was given in his honor. With the laying of paved streets, water, and sewer lines, the Battery Park development, created in the mind of E.W. Grove and successfully executed by Albert H. Malone, represented one of the great projects of its kind, costing over $300,000. When the project to remove a million cubic yards of dirt at a cost of $250,000 to level Battery Park was announced, it struck Asheville with a force that lingers in the minds of many residents. It seems only a few short months ago that giant trees, trees waved their branches on top of the hill. It was a virtual paradise in the heart of a thriving city. O'Henry Street, named in honor of the famous novelist, and Page Avenue, named in honor of Walter Hines Page, a distinguished North Carolinian, will soon be paved and open to traffic. I would say 30,000, shooting going toward 40,000 or thereabouts. That may even be an overshot. So here's a reminder of where, how high the dirt pile was. And then here's another joy of uh, doing research. At some point, someone put a mini golf course right there on the corner. I don't remember reading about that in Captain Castle. I would go there. So this is how the dirt got down into the Cox Avenue 
going. Mule cart after mule cart. From the third, the, um, 1913 Sanborn map, there's, uh, there's no entrance of Cox Avenue on the path. This is Ashland Avenue going down at an angle. There was an awful lot along the street front there. Uh, you had groceries, you had a cobbler, uh, several boarding houses, uh, bakeries. The Asheville Power and Light Company ran the uh, street railway system. What was what I found intriguing was there was an open air theater with a stage there. So this is, these are the buildings that they took out in order to make the entrance into Cox Avenue. And from the 1917 Sandworm map, that's what it looked like. So then we're going to we're going to look back from this view at several points. This is from the top of the Battery Park Hotel a couple years ago at a Preservation Society event. Now that's what it looked like in roughly 1923, 24. Can you go back again? That's Cox Avenue there, and this is Ashland Avenue. So this is Cox Avenue, and this is Ashland, and this is Otis Street coming down. So you can see that the we're looking down pretty much on the flattened earth. Uh, so what you have now are mule carts hauling the dirt down from the hill all the way down uh, Patton Avenue to Cox Avenue. Here's one that's a full cart, and there's an empty one coming back. And when you look at the size of those carts, and you know that there were a million cubic yards of dirt. <laughs> the other thing that uh, I like when I look at old photos, so I, I, I work down in the old public service building right next to uh, Laughing Sea Restaurant. And uh, so I'm very familiar with the area. So what I'm looking at here is the, uh, the buildings on Wall Street, or the fronted on Patton Avenue, had bridges that went from the second floor across to Wall Street. This is another view of it. It's all those. And over time, they were filled in, and it became Rat Alley. And Rat Alley is still there. Um, under, underneath those buildings, and it's still got rats, is that right? <laughs> don't know. Okay, so we're going to first look at a couple of the buildings. This one at the corner of Ashland, uh, on one corner of it, this was the Asheville Bakery. It had quite a few things. There was a hotel in it uh, and uh, several other ones. I love old buildings, and I don't know why they, this buildings like this are torn down. I mean, this is a beautiful building. I wish it were still here. This building was uh, the offices of uh, the Asheville Power and Light Company. And uh, the, as I said, they owned and ran the streetcar system. So here they're sending out a utility car, uh, car out on the tracks. Um, but behind the building is where they, they stored a lot of the streetcars and did repairs. This is about 1908, that photograph. Now here's a, 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 a telephoto view looking at the buildings. Um, so here's the one, the Asheville Bacon Company building. By this time it had a hotel in it. Uh, this building is the Asheville Power and Light. And then the Strand Hotel had been built. 
And this is a small gas and service station right at the corner. What's there now? A bank building. An ugly <laughs> bank building. <laughs> huh? We talk about multimodal transportation options here today. Well, this is a perfect example 100 years ago. Well, you have streetcars, you have automobiles, you have horse carts or mule carts, you have delivery trucks, and there was a pedestrian somewhere back there. Oh, there we go. And in a bit, I'm going to show you a bicycle. Uh, yes, it is. As a matter of fact, uh, we'll, we'll look at that in a bit. Now we're looking, we're digging as far back in this photo as we can to look at the southern end. And you have the Standard Oil gas station there, and some more cars. And this is a mystery hill we're going to explore throughout this. What are we looking at here? You're at the very bottom of Cox Avenue. So you've zoomed in and zoomed in, and this is Southside Avenue going down here. This is Cox Avenue. Lee Walker Heights is up on this hill. And uh, the um, ABCCM shelter was right about here. You can see that there's still quite a bit of gullies work that has to be filled in. Before we change to another view, the, these are some of the uh, Things we can look at. One, Aston Street used to just sort of dribble down into the gully. And here you can see how much fill they put in to be able to connect Aston Street to Cox Avenue. Just look at the gully that's there. Excuse me. Yes, was that gully a water course that needed to be filled in or tapped out? I would assume it had to be have a water course in it. So so where's that water now? Well, I, I imagine it just taps into whatever's in Southside, because Southside also goes downhill in that direction. It's still there. It's called Stinky Creek. It might have stopped. Oh, 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 Tom Branch or, or Nasty yeah. Branch? Yeah. Did it go into Nasty Branch? Stinky Creek. Yeah. <laughs> so this is Aspen Street. The old Ravenscroft School, and this is Ravenscroft Apartments, and that is Schoenberger Hall. I would assume so. Yeah. What road is that? Uh, I'm not sure. Schoenberger Hall was built in uh, 1887, and it became the residence of the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Western North Carolina. Two of those buildings still stand. This now is being used for offices, and that's still an apartment building. So let's go to the bottom and look up. Now we're sort of towering over the bottom of Cox Avenue, right where South, it, it uh, intersects with Southside. And that's, that's the look today. And it's not even the look today. This is maybe four years ago. This is already been converted to a restaurant. Uh, ABCCM now is, isn't that art studios? Um, there are all manner of things going on. How'd you get that photo? Uh, we were having tree work done at our house, and. Uh, the, one of the one of the guys, uh, I was able to convince him to meet me down there with his bucket truck and lift me up because I, I had because I had a print of that photo and I was trying to duplicate it. Look at the smoke coming off the battery. Yeah. So you want to go back? Yes. Okay.
So the only two buildings that existed right then were that Standard Oil gas station and the, um, this is the Mountain City Laundry. Also notice how precipitously the gully still falls off the edge there just that past the building. So we're, we're slowly going to make our way up the street. Now the cyclist right there has a good ride. <laughs> With automobiles came billboards. And up the, on the hill beyond the billboards, are the Ravenscroft Apartments, which still stand today. And then if we continue to look up in this photograph, you can see streetcars on Patton Avenue, the towers to the St. Lawrence Church, way in the background. The, this is the steel structures for the, one of some of the first buildings being built on Cox Avenue. And here, just moving our vision a little bit to the left, we see the second battery park towering over the view. And behind the Asheville Power and Light Company building, uh, some components to the streetcars where they were repaired and uh, stored. And balconies, the, the rear of the Strand Hotel. This was the spirit of the day back then. Real estate opportunities must be grasped when first offered as the, as the world is divided in two classes. Those who grasp opportunities and reap their reward, and those who let them pass and live with regrets. an aerial photograph of the area taken around 1925. We're going to explore this quite a bit. Uh, by this time, the upper part of the uh, Cox Avenue development was pretty well laid out. All the dirt work had been done, and buildings were starting to appear. To appear. This is oops, sorry. This is Aston Street, um, and this is Hilliard Avenue. <coughs> Down below, this is Hilliard Avenue, going right across there. That's Aston Street. So at the southern end, there's still a lot of uh, dirt work and grading to be done. You can see the uh, uh, disparities of the dirt. And the more I looked at this, the more I thought that this might be a retention pond that they created to catch the water that would be coming down along uh, the, the hill uh, rather than to go right down on the street. Um, this is Ashland Avenue School, which uh, became the school for African Americans. And this is that Mountain City Laundry building, which became the um, ABCCM shelter and now is in, I believe, Artist Studios. So here's the Mountain City Laundry. You can see the gully is still there. Today it isn't. It's all been filled in. 
Google Street View is just a wonderful tool. Can you go back? <laughs> you can also see the uh, uh, National Avenue School towering over it. So where did the dirt go besides that gully? Well, some of it went over here. That's roughly where the parking lot for Trinity Church is today uh, on Lexington Avenue. Lexington Avenue didn't exist at this time. It comes down this way. This is where Hilliard Avenue crosses Biltmore Avenue and curves around behind the food co-op yeah. to, to join um, uh, groups. South, South Market. And uh, anyone that uh, lives anywhere near there knows that that's the shortcut to take to get over to South Charlotte Street to avoid coming through the center of downtown. This is the most intriguing fill location. Okay, that's Hilliard Avenue and Church Street. And that's a huge amount of filth towering over those houses. And by the 1950s, that whole area had been filled in. You can see the change in gray. And that area, until they put in the Lexington Station condos, was, I think, was it called Union Storage? It was a moving storage company where they just <coughs> stored things. I was just asked, did Grove buy all these houses and bulldoze them? And I don't know. Well, Grove died uh, what, in the, toward the late 20s because they cut off the top of the um, Grove Arcade uh, after he died. Um, so this is what today we call South Slope. It, it, back then it was called Buxton Hill. And tucked under the trees is Schoenberger Hall and the, the um, with the north, what is it called? Well, I don't even know my own name. The fitting school that uh, Thomas Wolfe was taught at. And the, the, for the woods and the gardens, um, but they weren't going to stay that way for long. They too were demolished. And again, I've this is my mystery hill we're going to talk about in a bit. That they left that was after they were doing all the uh, excavation, and then by the 50s, this is what it looked like, which is pretty much what it looks like today, where you have. Um, Buxton Street and Bank Street and Collier Street and Miller Street. Um, and now it's the brew pub capital of Asheville. Where's the square in the middle right there? Or not really square. Um, that? Rectangle. No, it's the building that's in the middle of the triangle. It's a triangle. It's a rectangular, rectangular building. The one? That one, yeah. What is that? Do you know? I do not know. I do not know. I'm, sure, I'm sure it's a brewery today. That's where Cortex Donuts is. <laughs> is that? Oh, yeah. There was a skating right there. Oh, is that right? A skating ring? Okay. The REO dealership. Okay, now let's go back to our perch atop the Battery Park Hotel, and now let's go ahead a couple years in time. Here we have in the foreground the uh, excavation for the foundation of the uh, Grove Arcade. And keep in the back of your mind, we're talking, this is 1925, 26, how many cars are on the street? We're going to talk about that a little later. And the line of cars parked over here. Yeah. And then there were up on that hill that we looked at before. 
But that's what intrigues me when I looked at this photograph. What is that? The, the only time I've seen hills left behind when they do excavation are when there's either a power pole sticking out of the top of it or a cemetery on it. Or a holdout cellar. A holdout cellar. We're going to look at that, but I don't see, well, it could be, what, a property owner owned it? That's okay. what I would do. Yeah. That's could be, you know. That's during those years, it must have seemed that uh, Grove just had more money than the Lord might have body. Also, while you look at this photo, this is uh, uh, Sawyer Automotive. Notice that it's only two stories high in this photo. This is a photo of that hill from before, from the south side. And I, I looked at it, and I have to thank uh, Ione from the North Carolina room for really trying to enhance this as much as possible because I look at it and I said, what is that? Am I looking at two crosses? I don't know. The romantic in me says yes. So this building, J. Gorham Logan, um, was, that was one of the first buildings that was built on Cox Avenue. And uh, they basically, they were an official, an official service station for Exide Batteries, Delco, Remy, Claxons, Splitdorf, Kent, and Zenith. And they were very ignition, ignition units and other electrical components. Uh, the building still stands today. It was a bike shop several years ago. Um, I think I think Keller Williams has an office in there right now. Um, and then I saw that. I was intrigued by that. Now I've seen that somewhere else. Well, I've seen it right there, right where Patton Avenue comes up to Pack Square, and someone's going to have to tell me, is that a, an automotive, automobile traffic control, or is that for the streetcar system? It's a lifeguard stand. <laughs> <laughs> So Grove really, from the very beginning, he believed that the auto, he needed to make Cox Avenue an automobile center. So now let's move forward another couple of years. There's the Grove Arcade, relatively completed. There now is the uh, public service building. There's the building that had Costa's Men's Store in it. There's the, what I call the Edmonds Furrier building where uh, Kilwins is. Two of my favorite buildings still stand. They haven't been demolished yet. So let's, let's go down and explore. One, when we, were, when we were walking up the hill a while back, it was the steel structure for this building that we saw going up. This is the uh, Richburg Motor Company building, built in 1926, and it was the second Ford dealership in the city. In 1974, it was sold to Surefire Distributing. It had an awful lot of flammable materials in it because by 1984, it burned. Here, I remember that fire. Of course, its architectural beauty was continued in, in the building that replaced it. <laughs> Further down the hill was the BB Motor Company building. 
featuring an auto showroom and garage with an angled corner on the corner of Hilliard Street. Deal Buick used cars was on the left-hand side, and Burke Electric Supply was on the right. Further down now, with four stories, is the Sawyer Automotive Building. Still there, now it's condos. Um, it was built in 1926. I was talking with Jan Davis from Jan Davis Tire just yesterday, and he used to store his sports car in there. <laughs> now up the hill on the other side, this is actually the first building that Grove thought was going to be built which was the bus station. He wanted Cox Avenue to be the, the point where all cars, buses, trolleys meet. And it was gonna, it was gonna be an interurban center with uh, short term, uh, short distance travel and long distance travel all terminating here on Cox Avenue. Um, this was the Trailways bus station that either replaced it or has surrounded it, but this was demolished in 1985 uh, to make way for the current post office. This is another view of the Richburg Motor Company with the Sears building in the distance. So now that's the uh, Department of Social Services or whatever name they've given to that these days. And what's really fascinating is that's a large building. Now, when you see the new building they build next to it, this looks rather small. So what happened? How did it get that way? Well, they sure advertised a lot. One of the wonderful things that they were not shy about trumpeting the, their values. This is a full page ad that Grove printed uh, in 1924 in that central column. Business follows parking space. <laughs> Cox Avenue will be 66 feet wide from property line to property line, 50 feet between curbs and eight foot sidewalks. Cox Avenue will have no electric car lines. Cox Avenue has the easiest grade of any street north, south, east, or west approaching the business center. Cox Avenue has parking space for cars end to end, and on each side, plenty of space for traffic. Cox's extra 16 feet will be added this fall as the fill is completed. Question. Did Grove own Cox Avenue when he filled it in? Yes. He owned all of the property available for sale? Either he bought all of the property, or he, and it's possible that um, one of the Cox family bought the other half. But they, they basically, I believe it was he and someone else bought all the property going down the gully. Uh, and they, before he did it, they made sure that the cost of taking down the hill, moving all the dirt, making it developable, sell, and was going to be able to be recouped by sales. And, and he definitely succeeded in that. But the papers featured ad after ad like this. Uh, water seeks its own level. The automobile has spelled destruction as well as progress. And in every growing town, the congested narrow business street must either be laid out anew to fit modern traffic conditions or sink to a lower and cheaper level. Cox Avenue at its lower end now gathers in the traffic from South Side on the one hand and from Biltmore Avenue on the other. People now drive out of their way to avail themselves of the easy grade and wide freedom of this new approach and then figure out as best they can how to get into the retail district without fracturing more than half a dozen traffic rules on each trip. <laughs> but they were always wanting to get people to buy some property because you needed to have faith. 
This man had faith because he owned Argo Terrace and he was going to be able to sell the dirt and the property and, and buy into all the, the business prosperity that um, uh, Grove was creating up at the, where the Grove Arcade was built. So Cox Avenue was the automobile concourse of Asheville. What's most fascinating about this is unobstructed by streetcar tracks. Why was that important? We're going to find out. At the same time, this was going on. You saw all those cars. Well, the parking was just becoming utterly chaotic. So after months of debating and planning, the city commissioners finally adopted a parking law. And within a week, complaints were arising about that. And you had businesses um, wanted to be able to park in front of their business. They wanted to be able to drop people off. Uh, and so they, they didn't want parking um, prevented from in the streets in front of their businesses. But then you had other businesses that said, um, uh, people can't get to our businesses with all these cars parked here, so we don't want any parking on the street. <laughs> so two, two things were done to try and ameliorate the uh, traffic problem. The first, over there on the left, that was um, uh, E.W. Grove's company. Um, basically donated the creation of Short Cox Avenue to connect Billmore Avenue to the bottom of Cox Avenue. So people driving up Billmore to come into town could switch over uh, on Short Cox to get onto Cox Avenue, which as you've seen is a much more glorious boulevard in their description. And on the right, the, they created uh, Hilliard Street to be parallel to uh, Patton Avenue to take some of the traffic congestion off Patton Avenue. Here's the problem they faced. This, you're standing right next to the Asheville Baking Company building on your right, and to your left is the empty lot that those fuel <coughs> carts were going up and down, bringing the dirt. And you're looking up toward, uh, toward Pack Square, way down there. This is the old post office's tower. And it's a narrow street. Now think about, you have cars parked here. What would happen when a streetcar came down and then stopped to pick people up? How do you, one of the things they wanted to do, they wanted to get the streetcars out of there. They wanted to pull the, the, uh, the rails out of the street and eliminate that. They could because the Asheville Power and Light Company had uh, owned all that in perpetuity. And they, the city had no control over that. And I, don't, I believe it wasn't until World War II that they yanked the, the rails out of the street. So why don't we arcade Patton Avenue? How do you arcade Patton Avenue? Well, the group of local engineers came up with a wonderful idea. This is the um, public service building, and it's built back 10 feet further back into the lot. You can see that it's, it's setting back from its neighbors. What the city wanted to be done was um, for all the storefronts on the first floor to be pushed back 10 feet into the building and for the upper floors to be sorted supported by decorative uh, columns uh, and, and then the street would be widened to within one four foot of the exterior of the buildings so that the sidewalk all the way up past the, the streets would be underneath the buildings and they, they did their best to sell this. They said, well, look, you're, you're out from under the weather. Um, and this building, 
next to the public service building. It was a printing shop, so this was a loading dock. Uh, but that gives you some semblance of an idea of what it would have looked like where you would have been under the surface of the building. The, the idea didn't last long. And so they didn't do that. <clears throat> Instead, they peeled back the, the, the fronts of the buildings, uh, the 10 feet. Sadly, they didn't preserve the attractive facades of those buildings. You know, those were, those are pretty nice buildings. Yeah. Now it's just that orange brick. They did that throughout the city. Uh, the most impressive uh, example of this is if you stand um, up on Patton Avenue at Walnut Street and look down the hill to College Street, where the Crest Building is on your left and the construction of the old bb and building is underway, and you look at the little two-story building right there at the corner, and you notice that it has two, a window, and a window, and a window, and something cut the other window in half. And they just sliced the building, sliced 10 feet off the building. They also did that on Biltmore Avenue, over near um, where City Bakery is. But all this ambitious dirt moving just didn't stop there. Because we now have a tunnel. It says, if mountains stand between me and progress, I either tear them down or bore right through them. That's me. <laughs> Billy Bourne was our editorial cartoonist during the whole era of the 20s boom. Yeah, the, the, and he also has this little crow figure. He says, we're going to have a subway of our own. <laughs> Sometimes it's wonderful. You look at the paper for some things and you find other things because you forget that at this time, <clears throat> prohibition was in effect. Secret agent at work in city aiding sheriff's department in campaign against whiskey. There's the tunnel under construction. And of course, that's the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> Another major earth moving project. Okay? That's a quarry that's right across the river from the River Arts District. And in 1955, it became. Uh, Westgate Mall, wow. and if, if most of you, I think, have been here long enough to remember that the fill didn't quite stay the way it was supposed to, and the buildings that were built along this part <coughs> had to be demolished because the hill was falling down. <laughs> Could you go back to the original pictures? Yeah. So this is an old quarry right there. What they quarry in that place? I have no idea. <laughs> so this is the French Broad River. Up here is where the, the old uh, amusement park was. <clears throat> Notice here that it looks like this was taken when they were just building the first uh, part of the Smoky Park Bridge. What's, uh, what's that station that's underneath the bridge? That, I think that's where they stored school buses at that time. Yeah, that used to be the school service area for buses. Okay. And anyone that's driven this road knows that right over here you come under, you go under this railroad trestle, and if you have a vehicle pretty much anywhere taller than 11 or 11 and a half feet, you're going to take the top off of it. Then there was the uh, Crosstown Expressway in the 70s. Um, this is uh, the elementary school, not Hills, uh, Dixon. Dixon, Isaac Dixon. And so this is coming, coming off uh, the bridge and coming on to 
Patton Avenue right there. This is Haywood Street. And of course we have the car. Oh there it's under construction. All that traffic was being diverted into the tunnel. There's an aerial view. What year was that? 74. 74 is no. Uh, I moved here in 78, and they were they were finishing the blasting at that time. Hmm. So this was the sentiment in 1922, and this is what Billy Bourne drew. You know, the Asheville real estate values based on farsightedness, which is the flour, and steady growth, which is the yeast, and confidence in Asheville, which is baking powder. Well, we have our own editorial cartoonist these days, and it's David Cohen. First, it's a whole block downtown, then the Flatiron Building, and now Mission. What's going to sell next? What a quaint little city. Buy it for me, dear. Thank you. This, uh, this couldn't be done without all of these organizations and their commitment to preserving the, anything they can about our history. So uh, and when Lynn recommended or suggested that you join the Friends of the North Carolina Army, I second that, and I strongly urge you to do that. Thank you very much.